In four earlier episodes, I critically questioned the interpretation of passages that Jewish and Christian homophobes bring up to support the claim that the Bible condemns homosexuality. As we saw, they can say that, but only if they make certain choices about how to interpret the text. In response to those videos, a couple people have asked me whether there are passages that go the other way, that show direct acceptance of gay people. And my answer is sort of the same. It depends on your choices. Let's ask a few critical questions in this episode of Sounds Like BS, Positive Gay Images in the Bible. There are quite a few erotic passages in the Bible, so one question we could ask is, are any of them homoerotic? One scene that has turned people on for centuries is Jacob wrestling with an angel, alone, at night, probably naked, given how people wrestled back then, and he won't let him go in the morning. It also helps that the angel is referred to as a man at places, and we tend to picture angels as beautiful men with wings, even though it's entirely possible the angel is a four-faced monster covered in eyeballs. The language here is sexually suggestive, with the angel sort of punching Jacob in the dick to get away from him. According to S.H. Smith, though, this language may be used to assert Yahweh's control over Jacob's ability to procreate, not because the angel wanted to get some on a visit to Earth. What we have here is mainly a question of reader response. Some people, men and women, will find the image of two men rolling around on the ground together, well, hot. Whether the scene turns you on sort of depends on you. If it gets you going, it gets you going. Have fun with it. Jacob and the angel aren't really the same gender because they're not even the same species. So if we don't have two people of the same gender having sex with each other, are gay characters ever accepted in the Bible? There's one passage that I've had even students bring up to me as a potential case where a gay couple is accepted and even applauded. A story appears in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke in which Jesus heals a centurion's servant at a distance. There are some differences between the two, but the gist is the same. A Roman centurion, or military commander, has a sick servant, asks Jesus to heal him, and when Jesus offers to come see him, the centurion says not to trouble himself since Jesus could heal the servant where he stands. Jesus applauds the centurion's faith, heals the dude, end of story. Wait, so what does this have to do with sexuality? There are reasons to think that the relationship between the centurion and his manservant would likely have been sexual, at least at some point or on occasion. First, if he were a Roman citizen, it would be the centurion's right to have sex with the servant, who in Luke is specified as a slave. Second, as a soldier in a position of command, there's a fair chance the centurion would understand sex with his servants as a tool of domination or of discipline. It's not at all certain that the centurion was having sex with his servant, but it would be fairly common. And yet Jesus never says, oh, and by the way, if I heal this guy, you have to stop banging him. This leads Theodore Jennings and Benny Lou, for example, to argue that Jesus saw no problem with two men, or a man and a boy, having a sexual relationship. This reading is problematic for several reasons. First, let's deal with the fact that one of the words used for the servant is pais, or boy. The Greek word is also a root of our English words pediatrics and pedophilia. A sexual relationship between these two would be pedophilic in Roman culture, but not necessarily in the way we use the term. We actually know nothing about the age of the servant, and it's entirely possible that boy just refers to his social status rather than his age. As a slave, he will never be a man, no matter how old he is. A 26-year-old Roman man having sex with a 24-year-old boy was technically pedophilic. The age difference here is probably bigger than that, though, and we might expect the centurion to be in his 30s or 40s, the servant to be a teenager, which carries its own problems. I only want to point out that the centurion is probably not toting around an 8-year-old on a military campaign. Second, and more importantly, the relationship is still exploitative. Not only is there probably a significant age difference, there is definitely a power difference. One is a commanding officer in the Roman army, the other is a slave and has no legal right to say no to the centurion. While the centurion says the boy is dear to him, we never hear the servant's opinion on the matter. He's kept silent. Even if you don't object because the relationship is homoerotic, you may object because the relationship is coerced and potentially abusive. Finally, this reading is dangerous. Jesus rarely calls people out on their sins when he heals them, even though we might expect that Jesus, as a character in the Gospels, knows the bad things they've done. 
That doesn't imply he approves, just that healings weren't based on moral merit. Invoking this reasoning is very similar to a pro-slavery argument made in the 1800s. Jesus doesn't ask the centurion to free the slave either. Supporters of slavery claim this meant that Jesus approved of slavery. Now, anti-slavery interpreters of the Bible argued strongly that that wasn't the case. So we should be weary of reviving that sort of argument again to support a pro-gay reading, especially with a relationship that has a strong chance of being coerced and abusive. We can go even further by asking whether any of the main characters in the Bible read as gay-coded, perhaps in a serious relationship. As it turns out, there are three characters who have repeatedly invited interpretations as not quite straight, and strangely enough, they all come from the same family line. Let's begin with Ruth, the hero of her own book. She's a Moabite, so not Israelite, but she marries an Israelite dude. Unfortunately, Ruth's husband, her father-in-law, and her brother-in-law all die, leaving her, her mother-in-law Naomi, and her sister-in-law Orpah as three women with no source of income, no protection, and few prospects. Orpah returns to her mother's house, but Ruth clings to Naomi, a word used in Genesis to refer to the bond between a husband and a wife. Ruth tells Naomi, Entreat me not to leave you, or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May Yahweh do to me and more also, if even death parts me from you." When Ruth declares her loyalty to Naomi, it sounds a lot like wedding vows. In fact, in recent centuries, straight Christian couples have started using Ruth's declaration as a reading in their own weddings, only for lesbian couples to take the reading back when gay marriage became legal. Selena Duncan comments that Ruth found herself being drawn to the love of another woman, bonds stronger than her own with Moab. Her love for Naomi crossed ethnic and patriarchal boundaries. Thousands of lesbians have repeated her words in rituals blessing their unions. Ruth created family with Naomi. She may well have realized that they would both have a rough life ahead, two women attempting to live together without the protection of a man, and as a Moabite among Israelites, she might well expect scornful treatment. In other words, Orpah probably made the easier choice in leaving Naomi. Now, Naomi does eventually engineer a marriage between Ruth and an Israelite man, which ends their homelessness and poverty. They have a son, Obed, who has a son, Jesse, whose son, David, becomes the second king of Israel. Israel's first king was an unrelated guy named Saul. David worked for Saul as a music therapist and armor bearer, and then as a soldier. The first time Saul's son, Jonathan, met David, he immediately strips down and declares his love for his father's servant. Later, they reaffirm their personal covenant to each other, Jonathan made David swear again by his love for him, for he loved him as much as he loved his own life. But when the god Yahweh ordered Saul to commit genocide, and he left just one person alive, Yahweh called Baxes and endorsed David as the next king of Israel. David and Saul fight for seven years, and as part of David's counter-strategy, he uses Saul's son Jonathan as a sort of double agent, meeting with Jonathan to feed him information in clandestine meetings. Eventually, both Saul and Jonathan are killed in a battle against a foreign power, and David is devastated when he hears about Jonathan's death. David's eulogy includes the lines, I am distressed for you, my brother Jonathan. You are very lovely to me. Your love to me was wonderful, passing the love of women. So not only do David and Jonathan swear vows of love and devotion for each other over the course of years, but David claims that his love for Jonathan surpasses his love for women. Like his great-grandmother, even if David married heteronormatively, he saved his greatest declarations of love for someone of the same gender. The sexual ambivalence in Ruth's line continues with a distant descendant of hers and David's a certain... Ah, oh, Jesus Christ. For now, we'll leave to the side that Jesus evidently likes to hang out alone at night with strange young men in their underwear or that Judas chooses to identify him by kissing him. Instead, let's look at the Gospel of John. The text itself does not actually identify the author as John, but only as the disciple whom Jesus loved. Or in one case, potentially, the disciple whom Jesus used to kiss, using the same verb as Judas kissing Jesus. 
but the verb is ambiguous, so it's probably just another case of love. This disciple is introduced with Jesus spooning him while they share a meal. See, people in the first century didn't sit in chairs at a high-set table like you see in Da Vinci's Last Supper. They reclined around a low table with the most honorable man as the big spoon to the person next in honor and so forth. That's why the beloved disciple is introduced reclining in Jesus' bosom, his kolpos, which, despite pointing to the uterus in English words like colposcopy, means the valley of his chest cleavage or of his lap. Spooning may not be common behavior between two hetero men who are just friends, following strict gender norms in 21st century culture, but today it would fit perfectly within an intimate romantic relationship. The intimacy of the scene suggests the Colleen Conway that the beloved disciple's characterization in many ways resembles that of the Joannine women, while other interpreters have argued that the beloved disciple is a woman, specifically Mary Magdalene, and her pronouns have been changed to masculine ones to hide her identity. While reading the beloved disciple as a woman affirms the early leadership of a woman disciple, it also risks being anachronistic and mildly homophobic, as if to say that whatever intimacy these two figures share implies one of them must have been a chick. If we take John's language as it is, then Jesus loved a disciple notably well and was physically intimate with him in a way that few homophobes would be comfortable with today. All three of these interpretations invite challenging questions. First of all, what happens when we take the literary context into account? An observation from Friedman and Delansky about David and Jonathan applies to Ruth and Naomi as well. The declarations of love from Ruth and David happen in poetic verses. Poetic language tends to exaggerate, so we have to choose how literally to read these passages. Meanwhile, love is one of the central themes of the Gospel of John. Jesus is also explicitly said to love Mary, Martha, Lazarus, and the rest of the disciples. Although John uses the ambiguous phileo once, he never uses erao, the Greek word for sexual love. Most of the time he uses agapao, which has no romantic overtones. The disciple Jesus loved just sounds less touchy-feely in the original language. Second, is romantic love the main point of any of these texts? Are they love stories? A pretty strong argument can be made that they're each about legitimacy. Take Ruth, who's a Moabite, but also the great-grandmother of King David. Unfortunately, the Law of Moses says that no Ammonite or Moabite will be admitted to Yahweh's assembly. Even to the tenth generation, none of their descendants will be admitted to Yahweh's assembly either. Having a Moabite great-grandmother makes David's status as an Israelite questionable, much less as their ruler. The Book of Ruth attempts to justify her status, and through her David's, as an Israelite. Maybe declarations of her devotion to the Israelite Naomi and to her Israelite God aren't made for their own sake, but to underline that she belongs in Israel despite her foreign heritage. Likewise, David took the throne from Saul. Much of the Book of Samuel seeks to justify David's coup and show that he had nothing to do with the deaths of Saul or his male heirs, deaths that just happened to benefit David. Underlining his devotion to Jonathan and his grief at Jonathan's death helps make the case that David was just too honorable to have his rival killed, or even to celebrate his death despite all the perks that came with it. Much of the fourth gospel's portrayal of the beloved disciple seeks to legitimize him as a leader in the new Christian movement on a par with the apostle Peter. Although John admits that Jesus loved Peter in a general way, for the author to refer to himself as the disciple that whom Jesus loved elevates his status in the eyes of his readers. The same could be said for him resting in the place of honor at Jesus' last meal. The lane arrangement at these meals wasn't haphazard. For the beloved disciple to be in Jesus' lap suggests he outranks everyone else there, including Peter and the Twelve Apostles. More to the point, it echoes a similar description of Jesus in God's lap at the beginning of the Gospel, making a theological point. Just as Jesus is uniquely close to his Heavenly Father, and so can explain God the best, the beloved disciple is uniquely close to Jesus, so can offer the best understanding of Christ. Otherwise, the image of Jesus and all his disciples spooning with each other is somewhat ambivalent. On the one hand, every dude there is spooning with another guy, as you would find at any dinner like this. That doesn't mean every guy who attended a meal expected to get laid after supper. Dude bros might react with shock to seeing two straight friends lying with each other today, but 
chaste sexless spooning between men was just more common in the first century. On the other hand, the spooning is hierarchical, and in the first century, men often had sex with their subordinates. That is, sometimes these meals actually did lead to sex between men. It certainly wasn't unheard of. So many of John's readers would have shared a meal with other men like this without any sexual activity, but at least some of them would also have had sex either with or as the little spoon too. Since John uses the same image as one between a father and a son, we could choose to read the earlier passage into the later one and say that the physical contact between Jesus and the beloved disciple is similarly chaste and familial. After all, the next day, Jesus officially adopts the beloved disciple as his own brother. Recently, though, Benny Lou has attempted to let the incestuous implications stand and allowed the possibility of reading both images through a sexual lens. If one reads the phrase about Jesus being in the Father's bosom erotically, one will have to do the same with the parallel statement about the beloved disciple being in Jesus' bosom, adding, Likewise, if one, as Derrida implies, reads, I am in the Father and the Father is in me, as mutual penetration, one will have to do the same with the parallel language in reference to the disciples. By the way, keep in mind that this is a scholarly exploration of this language. When Lou pointed out the sexual ambiguity of John's language, conservative cancel culture gathered 14,000 signatures calling for his dismissal. Wait, what do you mean it's only cancel culture when liberals do it? How does that work? Spooning with someone is not necessarily sexual in the first century or in the 21st. And there are other ways one could choose to read that particular form of intimacy. But an erotic reading is possible. One merely chooses to hear it or not. All of this highlights a common criticism of all three of the readings. None of these stories is explicit about a romantic or even a sexual relationship between any of the characters. We may infer that David would only say that Jonathan's love was more wonderful than a woman's if he were gay, but it is an inference. It's how we might make sense of the text, not what the text says. Then again, inferring that all of these relationships were chaste and platonic is also an inference. The text never says explicitly that these characters were not in a romantic relationship either. However you read these passages, however you make sense of the love and devotion these characters show each other, it reflects choices you made in order to make some sense of what you're reading.